How did Gymshark win 2020? Consumer research. They worked with a test to learn more about their audience's changing habits, then pivoted their business to meet those needs. Visit askatest.com and use fast, accurate consumer research to get ahead. It's growth without guesswork. Hello and welcome to the D2C podcast. Today, we're diving into sustainable e-commerce with Stojo, a D2C brand with a mission to end disposable culture, one reusable product at a time. Sojo was one of, if not the first to market in this exploding field, launching their first reusable collapsible cup in 2012. Since then, they've established a strong brand, a loyal customer base, and have put up some incredible growth numbers, reaching 6.5 million in 2019, and on pace to exceed that by almost 100% so far in 2021. Uh, so today we're joined by, of course, co-host Kyle Guilfoyle, along with Stojo's co-founder and C- CEO, Jurian Schwartz, uh, as well as their brand and growth marketer, uh, Megan Holzhauer. Welcome to the DDC podcast. How are you guys doing today? Doing great. great. Fantastic. You Jurian. have a fantastic radio voice. I am very you. impressed. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I say it's like, uh, it's like uh, um, old timey acting. You need to put on like oil makeup and stuff so that people can kind of see. So I try, like I try to step it up a notch with my expression. Mm. Well done. Thank and I was complimenting you. him on his hat before we, we, we started rolling. Um, that logo looked super <laughs> modern and he was telling me it's actually a, a throwback. I can tell you got a real design eye just by looking at your product, looking at your website, and obviously your excellent taste in my hats. Uh, but Jury, I wanted to start with a question for you. You created uh, the first product way back in 2012. How has the perception around sustainable products changed since you started that? And, and just sort yeah. of uh, tell us the story of the brand as you answer that question. Sure. So um, back in 2012, um, my co-founders, uh, Alex and Ben, and I wanted to create a better way to drink coffee uh, sustainably. And for us, that was to get rid of the bulky reusable cup, uh, make sure uh, what we had was leak proof. So when we were done with it after uh, our coffee, uh, there would be no leaking or mess to contend with. Back then, um, it was certainly on people's radar, um, but it wasn't mainstream the way it is now. So I liken it to the early days of the organic movement. Uh, Anytime you have something like that, that's a cultural shift, it takes time to kind of ramp up. So back when we started all this, it was more of a concern uh, as, as a citizen and a, a member of the human race. Um, I thought, man, um, you know, we got to do something about all this trash. And it, it's really stark when you live in New York City and you're walking around the streets and going to work and going about your life and you look in the, the waste bins and just the garbage that's everywhere. It's hard to miss it. Uh, when you live in other parts of the country, it, it might not be so visible. Um, and, and so what's happened since then is the, the drumbeat of people demanding that we do better has gotten consistently stronger. Um, some big uh, shifts have occurred, namely that China, which used to be the number one buyer of recycled kind of waste uh, from the United States, shut off their borders. Uh, It got so bad on the side of the Chinese environmental uh, kind of, um, you know, damage that was being done as as factories sought to take that waste and turn it into new stock for for new products. The byproduct of that was was a lot of pollution. And so they actually shut it off. So when that happened a few years ago, uh, suddenly all the municipalities around the United States uh, didn't have anywhere to put their, their recycling. And it's just building up. Um, and, and then I think the other thing that's changed is, uh, 10 years ago, you could go around to most of the beaches in the world, uh, especially the nice beaches where people with money went and it was pretty clean, pretty pristine today. You can't find an ocean beach that doesn't have garbage on it. And, and it's actually washing up from out of the water. Um, and so I think the, the problem has gotten a lot more acute and it's a lot more front of mind. Um, and there's a lot more, more eyeballs on it. So that's been a fundamental shift. I read that you also hear, you know, it was having a kid in a way that sort of, uh, I had a kid around the same time in 2014 as well. And just as a parent, the amount of single use plastics that you go through, it just gets more noticeable um, as, as you do that. So I, am, I can see why that would kind of, and especially being in a place like New York, where you're literally on top of each other, you know, you're going to notice other people's uh, habits and behaviors a lot more. Absolutely. My son was born actually the same month that we launched our Kickstarter in June 2014. And 
while I started the project before I'd even imagined having a son, um, once I went commercial and left my job in finance to build Stojo into a brand, um, it, it, it actually became the reason behind why I decided to stick it out and, and really make that career shift. Um, and it's really what's helped to motivate me uh, during, during the tougher times. Um, it's, it's pretty, uh, it, it's, it's, it's pretty like obvious what parents will go through uh, for their children um, in a lot of ways. And, and I think that has really helped kind of light the fire inside me that, that has me committed to, to trying to make a change for, for, the, for the good. You'll do anything for your kid. You want convenience in, in the way that you're parenting and stuff, but at the same time, you have this long-term vision of what their world's going to be like, uh, how big the Texas-sized garbage lump in the Pacific Ocean is at that point. Uh, so I really understand that. The one other thing that I would that I would maybe ask about, like having you know how, how these things have changed um, since 2012, is that we're now at the point where there's 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 a wide adoption with this stuff, and it's almost like cups like yours, products like yours in general they're not just utilitarian as well. There's almost, there's like a status that comes with them just because they're so beautifully designed as well. That's, that's totally right. Um, there's uh, um, some, some uh, reporters have, have uh, coined this term called Stojo smug. And, and that represents how you feel when you roll up into a place and you see your peers and the uh, reusable cup or the reusable water bottle has become somewhat of a status symbol. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's been a huge shift um, where uh, probably 20 years ago, you might pay like a couple bucks for a, a Gatorade bottle. And today people are paying anywhere from, you know, 20 to 50 to even hundred dollars for uh, various travel tumblers and, and sustainable kind of reusable water bottles. So, uh, so you guys, um, you, you started in 2014, you were ideating probably for a couple of years before then launched in 2015. Um, but I imagine growth didn't happen right away. And so I'm wondering if you could, uh, take us on that, that growth journey and, um, and just pick out any, any catalysts along the way. Yeah. Uh, happy to. So I'm a numbers guy. I came out of finance. So, um, like, like you said, we ideated prototype for a couple of years, launched a Kickstarter that ultimately did about 130 K in July of 2014, it took us almost a full year to actually launch the product and go commercial. Uh, when we did that, we had a very, very small sub 200K seed investment from friends and family. And um, the revenue went something like this, and it can be found on, on Republic, we're raising capital there, so there's no, no real trade secret here. Um, so we did 200K in our first half year, 2015. Um, I was a one-man show, by the way, until uh, halfway through 2018. So 200K, following year, we did 340. The year after that, we did 400 and change. And then in 2018, we did 2.7 million. Um, in 2019, we did 6.5. So that was the trajectory. Um, and uh, like I said, 2018, halfway through, marked my first hire raised a small seed capital round of, of 700K at the beginning of 2019, built out a team to about 10 people where we are today uh, and have been going strong ever since. And what, 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 what would you attribute that, um, that like three to four X growth in, in 2018? In, in large part, the foundational work that we did to establish an omni-channel business from 2015 to 18, which uh, for us meant uh, direct to consumer business on uh, powered by Shopify. Uh, it meant an Amazon account. It meant uh, independent retail accounts in the United States. And then we partnered with some really remarkable international distributors. Um, and when going back to your original question, Eric, about the timing of the, the kind of the arrival of the sustainability movement in the United States, if you've been tracking things, um, you know all along. What you'll note is that Europe has always been ahead of the curve uh, in terms of uh, being concerned about the environment. Um, and then, interestingly enough, Asia was ahead of the United States. And I think I attribute a lot of that to the fact that Asia has um, almost all of its cities are on the coasts, and it's very coastal. And and it it was very obvious to see how tourism has been hit by pollution in the ocean. So um, getting distributors in those countries, Stojo is available in, in over 40 countries today. 
um, getting all that kind of laid out really, really created the Stojo flywheel um, that, that really took off in 2018. Omnichannel from the start. I think I think that's a like that's sort of in your strategy kind of baked in, which which seems to make a ton of sense. Like when it comes to these like retail partners, was that just a was that just an effort of like smiling and dialing? Like really just say, here's my product. Like is, is that just a, a pure grinding effort to get on that many people's radars on the retail side of things? So it's a combination. Um, first of all, um, when you're when you're launching a product, product market fit. And, and the, the image that your brand conveys on first glance, first introduction is something that some people do really well um, and they can do it system systematically. Uh, they've done it many times over and over. Uh, I was not that. Um, some people do it decently well their first time around and some people are awful at it. Um, and so I think we kind of hit that center one. I think there were some, some really strong consumer tendencies that, that were pointing to the need for a collapsible um, designer uh, product that helped us. And then, you know, going into all those meetings and keeping positive and sharing the bigger vision on how we weren't just a single product, but we were actually um, a, a brand, a platform with many more products coming soon after. Um, and the, the Stojo Cup being our first product, I think that gave them um, kind of the confidence to give us a shot. Um, the first three people we talked to uh, actually came to us and they found us on Kickstarter. So Kickstarter is a great place for retailer to discovery. Uh, the first one was the MoMA design store. Uh, the second one was the Gromit. And then the third one was Bed Bath & Beyond. Um, and interestingly enough, Bed Bath & Beyond took us three years to get there. Um, even though we had that first meeting and we learned a lot along the way. And, and really, um, it, it took three years of hard work to get us to the point where we were ready for retail um, and things started taking off finally only in 2018. Wow. I, I, so now just to back up, uh, just we like to do things in reverse order here, but the actual product design is such an interesting thing for me because I think you really nailed it that it's, it really is, you know, that's a huge part of the battle, I think, whether you're selling something at not the highest AOV, Right, like your your right. products aren't you know at, at, um, individually they're not that that fifty dollar plus AOV that that marketers mm -hmm. are looking for in the current environment. So yeah, yeah. I feel like you, your growth is a lot to do with just the product and how well you nailed that. Like, did you bring on a, a Johnny Ives type product designer? Did you sketch it out on a napkin? Like, how did the actual product design happen? Yeah, um, so it was truly a team effort. Um, Alex, who I worked with at Credit Suisse, he was actually my manager. He and I. Um, literally started the company because we were trying to find that Tim Ferriss four-hour work week product that we could start a side hustle on and then eventually become rich and retire. Uh, that was what we were doing <laughs> when we first started it. So he comes in one day and says, I got, I got a perfect product. It's a collapsible coffee cup. And he pulls out the Sea to Summit uh, camping cup, which was made out of silicone and collapsible. Yep. And I didn't, I didn't really think it was a great idea. Um, I, I was like, it's a product. What are we going to do with this? Um, I, I kind of went away and a couple weeks later, um, I, I, I actually had this aha moment. My grandmother, who I was raised by, used to be a professional daycare provider. And in the dish rack, she would dry all the baby bottles. And if you know anything about how a baby bottle works, there's a uh, reservoir made out of polypropylene or some other plastic. There's a collar and that affixes a silicone nipple uh, to the bottle and that creates a leak proof seal. And when I saw that, I realized, oh my God, that's how I can create a leak proof lid on a collapsible uh, cup. And I literally went and sketched it out on a napkin. And then I created a 2D side view on PowerPoint. And that's when we set out to try and design it. Um, we did not have the money it took to design a product from scratch with an industrial designer. Uh, the estimates we got back were like 30K to get a working prototype and another 50K to bring something to market. And there was no way that our significant others were gonna okay that kind of capital commitment from us. So we did the next best thing, which is what I would recommend to anybody starting up, um, is we found a friend, uh, Ben, who's our third co-founder, who coincidentally went to college with Alex and um, they serendipitously met at a Halloween party for their kids um, a couple months after we'd started. And he shared that he was doing industrial design on the side. Um, we said, hey, you want to be our partner? Help us make this thing. Um, and then from there, it took us two years to kind of work on it. Ben is 
uh, not a professional industrial designer today, but he's a genius um, when it comes to figuring out form and function. He's, he's really a diamond in the rough. And he came up with that iconic shape based on my, my crappy PowerPoint uh, sketch. Amazing. And, and that's what we built the platform and the look and the design on. So um, large part to him, it was a, a big thank you. Very and good. I'm, I'm, and I'm curious, while you were doing all that, were you still working in finance? Full time, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, the the adage of don't quit your day job until until you've either got enough capital raised to to pay yourself or your your side hustle makes enough money to kind of get you to a, a living wage. Um, I definitely followed that, especially as a new dad. Um, and uh, so so that was our our path. You know, we lived in in Brooklyn, New York City, so pretty pretty expensive place to. Uh, to try and do a startup, and then when you're in your 30s and have children, it's it's a lot a lot different than if you're in your 20s and you're you're living somewhere with a lower cost of living. For sure, and um, you know, I, I I imagine you have quite a few uh, folks who uh, try to copy your concept or new entrants uh, coming up with a, a similar concept. Uh, how do you how do you go about building uh, building your brand moat and and beating those copycats? Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm only going to speak specifically and generally enough to my category. Um, this does not hold for tech and, and other more complex things. But, um, you know, in the US, um, specifically, you can get a utility and a design patent. Those are the two. So for all our products, we go after utility and design patents. They're really important. The design actually protects the form and the look and the shape. And then the utility is kind of the thing that's your secret sauce on, on how you made it work. So we went and got that. And then we got them in China as well um, for our first product. And that kind of um, is the cheapest way a, a person who's making stuff in China, a, a physical product, can kind of protect the US market and then the global market. Because if you can find people copying you in China, you can actually shut them down. And, and once, if you get a patent, um, what happens is, is as you find um, people that are infringing and getting too close, you have to strategically decide who you're going to go after with legal counsel. It's not cheap, and you just kind of got to do what you can. Um, a lot of this, um, the, the pirates come out of China, and it's, it's a whack-a-mole process. Um, but what the U.S. patent really helps you do is make sure that none of the big players who see an opportunity to copy you will do it because they know how painful it will be if they go out and sell millions of dollars of revenue, and you get them three or four or five years later with a lawsuit, um, the damages will be huge. So that, that's kind of what protects you. Um, for anybody who does have IP, there's a great platform that we've used very successfully called uh, Red Points. And it's a AI kind of learning platform that can scour all the marketplaces in literally every single country around the world and look for trademark infringement, copyright infringement, and things that are very close to you and you, you train it over time. It serves up every day um, all, the, all the potentially new infringing listings that it finds and you train it by saying yes or no. Um, so we've literally taken down tens of thousands of copycats over the years. I think that's so interesting. This, this past week, we just covered the story uh, of the, the brand that made the, the hip carrier or, or a backpack that has a very specific form and function that they built out. And then they, they, they noticed that Amazon almost told, sold it sort of entirely. And I wonder, you know, now they're building this ad campaign around this. And I think it's successful for them because they're getting a lot of earned media from it. Um, but it sucks to have Amazon rip you off. And it's interesting with a product like yours that you, protect, you guys are protected against that. Yeah. And, you know, um, I don't know if, if Megan wants to chat to that. Amazon's a really strange beast because it's kind of like... Um, you, you need them. Uh, it makes so much sense. They have such a, a, a wide footprint. It's basically the Google of, of marketplaces. It's where people go to comparison shops. So I would never want, uh, you know, somebody from Amazon to hear me saying that I'm not happy with certain aspects and, and shut us off. And they no. can certainly do that. Um, but a lot of our biggest infringers are sold on Amazon. And Amazon absolutely does not shut down things unless you put up uh, it's, it's actually harder to get things off of Amazon than it is anywhere else. And frankly, what's the most disappointing is that you, when you're talking to the IP people there, they're not trained professionals, they're not lawyers, they're actually call center people somewhere over uh, in Southeast Asia. 
and they literally get to decide whether or not to listen to your, your complaint or not. So it's not settled in the courts um, and it's, it's pretty frustrating, but Megan can talk a little bit to using press as a, as a kind of stick to get Amazon to move more quickly, maybe if she wants to. I don't yeah. Think. Stack Adapt is the highest performing programmatic native display, video, and connected TV advertising platform. Looking to elevate your digital ad campaigns with cutting edge technology and machine learning? Learn more at stackadapt.com. Megan, why, why don't you tell us a little bit about your role at Stojo as well? And, uh, and then, yeah, you, you definitely go into that. That'd be great. Yeah, so I, I lead brand marketing creative uh, at Stojo. So that's everything from PR, also aff affiliates kind of under there as well. And just um, part of the, the core marketing leadership team that's thinking about growth, that's thinking about our brand and really and thinking about that brand moat that we're building. And just to touch on that a little bit, there's certainly the platforms and the copycats. And what we also bring to the table that none of those copycats are going to is that brand. And we have a very clearly defined mission to end disposable culture that we are not, um, we're, not we're not shy about. We go out there in the world and we have this ethos around having fun and, and with a tagline, have fun with less. And it's when when you hear often often the, um, the conversation around, around uh, global warming and uh, and the, the, the garbage, uh, the, the waste problem that we encounter in our world today, it can feel very scary and daunting and, and frankly, paralyzing. Like, I, why should I even try kind of thing? And we want to, we want to wipe that away and, and, and really be about making, encouraging small incremental shifts towards a more sustainable life and make it easy and fun and um, and beautifully designed, um, the colors that match your outfits, uh, and and, um, and and colors that kids love, and kids that the whole family can get excited about. And um, so we, we think about that from like the product and a ton of detail, attention to detail on the product, and also how we we, um, we speak to our community because we really do have a hyper engaged community, and that is a really important part of our our success. We we just did a friends and family pre launch of our next collection, um, which is a foray into food um, and from from um, previously drinkware and now into food. And we sold out, <laughs> there's Durian showing our Sojo oh, Bowl. Um, we, we sold that out in a few hours um, with our friends and family pre-launch. And now we're, we're positioned to, uh, and that there, there are people who, when we started teasing it on social, were say, saying things like, I'll buy anything that you sell, Stojo. You know, like that's the kind of thing, like because they know what we're about and they know that this is a team of, of good people who care about making a making change on the on on this earth. And um, and that's something that like no other brand or they're not even a lot of them aren't even brands, but no other product can can do. It's, um, it's yeah. such a good product too, because it's like it, it's something, you know, retail therapy is a thing. People like to buy things, you know, you know, in, in their daily life. And when you can buy something that looks good, makes you feel good about yourself, makes makes you feel like you're making this incremental change or whatever, it seems like a really a perfect storm for for especially for these past, you know, this past year essentially. Yeah, a lot of people. So the first time that we um, when we we launched the Stojo bottle, and I I first brought it to a yoga class, and then I looked around and I saw all of the single use plastic. It just makes you having a having a stojo, having a reusable with you all the time, reminds you of what like of the problem, and just like reminds you of like that you're part of the solution. And um, and and our goal is to get more people into the mix and get excited about using reusables and um, excited to bring your own bowl to put your leftovers in when you're when you're out to eat. And you know, slightly more future forward, but. Um, but it's coming soon, and the the like that life of going to restaurants and giving them a container to fill up and bring back, and um, and people are hungry for it, and um, and the, the product is is matching with the um, with the consumer's desire is to make that difference. People are hungry for it, and also I just, we took a look at your ads. I saw the Huffington Post is interested in it. Um, uh, Jurian mentioned there a story about using earned media uh, in order to actually sway a decision on the Amazon side. I'd yeah. love to hear you go into a little bit about how you've leveraged press and earned media in growing this brand. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so the, um, the Amazon story is um, actually, I, I lead, um, I lead marketing for, for two brands for Stojo and for a brand called State Bags. And, um, and it's a really interesting model as um, uh, um, that I split my time about half and half between the, the two brands. And I, it, it's incredible because it really allows me to see growth of two companies um, that have different products, have different, a lot of different things, but have a lot of the same things. So, so something that's been really valuable for, um, for both brands as, um, as I've been looking at each channel um, one by one and either turning them on or optimizing. And affiliate marketing has been a really important channel for both with a lens for editorial content. So I found uh, a, a, a really incredible um, affiliate, um, um, a, a affiliate manager, um, affiliate strategist who has, uh, has a very strong eye and incredible connects in the PR world who has, is just able to get us like hit after hit after hit that also both drives revenue. And, um, and, and we're, we're, we're also working on creating on a, a cadence of both product and brand storytelling pieces that we can just like really looking for every month. We have a new, uh, a new piece like this that is both um, driving brand recognition, telling our story and driving revenue. And that you're using in your ads again and again in an evergreen. Fashion. And then we can put it in the, really? yeah, the leverage for our, our ad creative. Yeah, and and another thing that um, Megan kind of touched upon, but that and and you hear it time and time again, but I, I definitely want to underscore it for anybody who's listening and trying to start their own thing. Story is so important. The world has been telling stories forever, right? The the oldest kind of anything going back is stories around the campfire and people still want to hear a great story. And so you, you, you can't do any better than to have a product and a company and a brand and a mission that, that intrinsically has a good story that um, either gets people excited or inspired or angry or sad or something evoking a real emotional response in that story. Um, it's super important to think through before you even spend a dollar on whatever it is you're planning on doing, uh, especially in a, in a commercial setting, because when you go to press, they're human beings. And if, if that story doesn't catch them, if it doesn't somehow draw them to you, they're going to go write about somebody else. Now you can pay for it, um, but that's not sustainable. Uh, and what you're going to end, end, end up doing is actually spending uh, your hard-earned money uh, to get placement for something that ultimately won't resonate. Uh, disposable so, press. Who wants mm -hmm. disposable press? Yep, exactly. I like that. Disposable yeah. press. And I'm curious, how how would you recommend uh, a brand craft that story? You know, because you know we we hear about brand storytelling and stuff like that. Um, but I, I do. It's you know, there, there definitely is obviously an art to it. And I'm, I'm curious what your, what your take is and, and how you'd recommend someone craft that, that story. God, I mean, Meg, do you want to take a shot at that? I don't, we've never actually talked about it because we intrinsically had that, but that, that'd be an interesting thing for you to, to take yeah. a shot. Yeah. I mean, I guess I, I would say like, find somebody who knows how to do it. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, Here's the thing is like some people are really great. I, there are a lot of things I'm not great at. So I find people who are great at that to do that thing. So if you are, if, if, if as a founder having a really hard time putting the pieces together, I, I would, I would ask, ask around. I mean, um, people with PR backgrounds tend to, um, tend to know what lands with PR and can help kind of formulate a story. And uh, or journalists, um, friends who are writers and journalists, um, or, or just to find those people because those are the people who are going to typically be really good at it. And um, like Jurian is really naturally good at it. He was able to do it from the beginning. And you know, it's something that I, you know, I I've had so much to build on because he did so much of that foundational work from from the start. And um, I think my my best advice would be to make sure that you're like you've got somebody. Um, doesn't need to be like a full-time member of the team, but that you're, you're, you're sharing the story. I guess this is it. It's kind of like, like stand up sometimes, like you find a bunch of different ways to tell the story and see what, what lands for people. 
if um, you're a founder, you just got to be able to tell that story. Like if you, if you're, if you're a founder and you've started a brand that doesn't have a story, you should rethink that you know, in a way you should sort of go back and, and, and yeah. actually, you know, like everyone has a story to tell. And I think, and, and for us as a, as an agency at pilot house, like we're constantly taking those founder stories. We're building them into what we call pre-sale pages as a way to improve conversions or average order values or putting them into ads or putting them into posts as, a, as to give you another look. I, I imagine you guys have leveraged this story in all sorts of ways across your marketing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's, that's really interesting. And, um, and it's both leveraging our story and also leveraging our assets. So when you think about, because you, when, when, as a brand, when a small brand, you're, you're investing in things like uh, your core story, you're investing in things like assets, photo assets, or video assets, you, um, or maybe you're, you're working with a, a content creator, an influencer, and you, they're going to create, you know, five or six photos or videos for you really want to be thinking about like how am I using this across all of my channels and and being and and how does this also link to the storytelling of not just the brand storytelling but also use case in it scenario um like how would you somebody be using your product to to jog in their minds like oh okay like I should get this because of, of that reason so really mapping out how you're using your story how you're using your content um because these are all investments that need to be thoughtfully made yeah, I've, I've got another um, take on that for anybody who maybe doesn't have a great story. Um, if you think back to, I'm going to date myself, but that that MTV reality show, Real World, right? That's a show about a bunch of people who were fun to look at and fun to watch, but actually there was no plot line really other than a bunch of people live in a house together. Okay. Um, so there, there wasn't really a story, but there was a lot of compelling dynamics that were going on. And so, you know, you don't have to necessarily have a story if your product makes sense and people know what it is. You could actually, um, you know, let the people that you work with um, talk about what they're doing in a day-to-day -day way. Like have that graphic designer take you through their process, have that CEO talk about, you know, uh, what's happened with investors. That's kind of what we're doing here, right? We're on a podcast telling the real facts about what happened, et cetera. So there's opportunities to tell stories in everything. It's like when you're, when you're, you know, when your significant other comes home, it's like, you won't believe my day. And you're like, huh, you know, that's a story. So th there are, it's just tell a story and make sure it's succinct because people have attention spans of about three to five to 15 seconds nowadays. And if you can tell it within those parameters, that, that's your angle. And refine it over time. It's funny where I talk to advertisers all the time on, about the D2C, uh, you know, newsletter and podcast come on and advertise. And I tell the same story every time about how we started and this convergence of the grassroots marketers and the biggest companies in the world all trying to go D2C. And every time I get a little bit better at it, I'll add a new wrinkle. I'll look for, you know, reactions. And yeah. uh, it, it, I, it's just something you kind of have to continually refine, I think. And that's that stand up thing that Megan, you know, talked about. Yeah. It's like, you're just, you're yeah. always refining it. It's, it's got to be genuine. It's got to be authentic, yep. but you can overemphasize certain things, dial back other things, and you can even cater it to your story. Because if I'm talking to certain people, I'll, I'll dial up the, hey, I'm a green dad story. If I'm talking to super sustainability people, it's all about the sustainability. If it's an investor, it's all about the growth. And they're all true, but you only have so many seconds to capture somebody's you know, attention um and and so you gotta you gotta be thinking about that so storytelling is really important for any founder and uh yeah i mean the the found the founder story is like a it's a it's a version of an origin story and uh and and every single person who works at your company has an origin story you know exactly. that you know ties back and or ties into why they're there and same with your products every product has an origin story too so yeah i love that um, nice i'm working on my comedy set right my three minute routine is called all my jokes are dick jokes <laughs> my last name is dick if people don't know that my last name is dick uh that's all my picks are dick oh, it's all appropriate my, all, my, all my posts are all my picks are dick picks. okay so let's quickly move on from that uh i wanted to just ask about channels you know we're always looking we're you know we're a, we're a traffic company we're all about buying on on all these different platforms uh can you guys talk a little bit about uh like what platforms you're loving is there any is there any, are there any new platforms you're looking at exploring or that are seeing paying some early dividends I'm happy to jump in. Uh, you, want to... uh, you you go for it, and then I'll, I'll if you miss anything that I think, I'll just jump back in. Go for Great. it. So 
our our primary channels are um, our organic channels, our our email, our um, our SMS, our our social, and then we have paid social and um, and Google. So our performance, we've got a team that's that's leading our performance and affiliate. So um, of of those channel, I you know, <clears throat> Facebook continues to to be. Um, more or gets more and more challenging, um, you know. So we're we're currently looking at additional, you know, but we that channel is something that we want to um, in the in the next three to six months we are we are um, going to optimize and then and then expand into additional um, other channels for top of funnel to to because Facebook's gotten is getting really expensive for top of funnel prospecting. So we're exper experimenting. We'll be experimenting with podcasts. And, um, and, and some other things. Um, we've got a, an influencer gifting program uh, as well as some, some organic PR outreach specifically around, uh, around launches. So that's, that's our full um, kind of mix right now. And our, in your, in your, I, I, think, I think SMS is really, you know, is, is interesting um, if we can, um, if we can like, figure out how best to um to grow it without being too promotional how are you using it now because i sms to me is one of those asymmetrical opportunities 99 percent open rates we talk about it all the time but yeah. not everyone's using it you know in the way that they want to be using it exactly i'm curious how you guys are using sms yeah right now we're we're working with a, a company called tone and it's very kind of conversational and and it is specifically focused on our um, our, our, our checkout and like kind of automated flows for, um, for customers that, um, that drop during checkout. So I, and, and over at State Bags, um, we're, we're using it um, in, a, in a, a different way. We're working with Attentive and we're doing it we're, we're in a really robust like automated flows for um, we, everybody who drops onto our website. We're collecting both SMS and email and, you know, Attentive is kind of the big, you know, Biggest player in the space, venture backed. What are you incentivizing and, them to get that information? What are you with a discount? We're or? doing a discount. Yeah, we're doing a, um, a, a gosh, I think a ten or fifteen percent discount for that. And our list is growing month after month um, in a in a really robust way. And we've been using it for for really interesting, just last minute things like like in last November. I mean. November, December last year was so crazy because everybody's like, when does, when does this holiday season start? Like some people were sending, I remember seeing a Madewell email about like Black Friday came early and it was like November 8th. And I was like, what is happening? But we were, um, and then I saw on November 11th, 11-11, all of these US brands were doing, um, were doing uh, singles day sales. And I was like, oh no, we didn't do a singles day sale. Like, you know, should we do a singles day something? And we just did a small thing on, on SMS and, you know, drove, drove some really strong revenue that day, only available to our SMS. And then we shared it on social that you, that we're offering these like fun, random things that are only available if you're uh, like, you know, if you're there on SMS and our revenue per user for SMS is like five or six dollars per per user on our on our list like yes they are they typically are people who respond and react to things that are promotional but it's not things that are that we're not promoting it to across all of our channels it's just to to SMS I like that and it sounds and you're doing something unique and different there it's not the regular you know it's not always the same sales message is it something where you're doing it with your one, one of the ways that i've heard uh, sms used best is really as like a with your vips as a reason to really give your vips more value is that something you've considered yeah yeah i think we i mean we do so we we do um we also give um like early access to product launches on sms so it's not just promotion it's it's kind of like you're our insiders like we you know, on um, like inauguration day, we're like, we're feeling awesome. You know, like let's let, well, we share, you know, shared something, sh sh shared something there. It's a, also a testing ground. Like do percentage um, discounts work better or dollar discount, like dollar amounts or, you know, which there are all kinds of things that we can just like test. What? Yeah, which we, we, this <laughs> is something we run into all the time. We, we just did a headline test last week. And we were, yeah, we we're actually, we don't, we're getting the data for this next newsletter as to a percentage versus a dollar. I was wondering if you had any, if you had a, an answer to that. 
Yeah, well, the one test that we did um, for for well for state was was like dollar amount, even though yeah. even when it didn't it, when it when it was less to than the percentage amount. Um, the that's like the amount. third pounder. That's like the 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 McDonald's trying to release a third pounder and being like it's bigger than a quarter pounder, but the number's smaller, so it didn't sell. Yeah, that's really yeah. funny. Yeah, you, the, the, like consumer like pricing and consumer psychology are not always what you think is no. going to happen. So that's why you got to test. But Good SMS terrible. has been a, a really strong testing ground for us. Anything to add there, Jurian? Yeah. So um, me not being a traditional growth D to C uh, marketing guy, um, I look at <clears throat> my brick and mortar retailers as a channel um, because it's a way to generate positive contribution margin and be front and center of people um, who are out shopping and they're pushing a cart around and they're ready to buy. Um, and so especially someone like us who is very visual and has a, has a big pop of color, um, you know, I see it as a, a chance to get eyeballs on the brand. And, um, you know, in the same way, I'd, I'd almost call some of our online retailers who we selectively allow to sell Stojo products, it's another channel. So when we do it, we are very careful uh, as to who we allow to sell our product online. Um, as, as you know, as a, as, a, as a D2C kind of growth team, you know that allowing other bigger brands to kind of promote um, against and bid on your keywords and, and your brand name and all that stuff can actually have the reverse effect and drive your costs up, which is not a good thing. But when you're a new brand, um, sometimes having that social proof of a real cool curator and tastemaker saying, hey, this is a dope brand, um, it, it actually works in the long run in, in terms of curating that brand. So um, those to me are two, two great, often overlooked channels. Um, and then the third, I would say, we have a, we have a pretty interesting, um, B2B business, and, and most of it is corporate gifting and promotional items, but sometimes it's it's actually merchandising. So um, believe it or not, Starbucks Asia is our biggest retail partner in, in the world um, outside of the United States. Um, and we're in uh, nine Asian uh, countries, but we've done things like dropped limited release Stojo Starbucks um, you know cups online and, and sold out of like 5,000 units in under five minutes. Uh, that happened in South Korea. Um, so when you've got people carrying a global brand did cup with, you know, that's a stojo around, um, those are more eyes on, on your cup and your design and your form factor. So uh, those are three areas that I think, you know, it, it's very specific to a certain kind of product, but um, those can be really interesting um, ways to generate top line revenue, get positive contribution margin and have advertising um, that's actually profitable as opposed to a cost center. Amazing. Uh, great insight there. I wanted to ask, I dig a little bit more on affiliate because affiliate to me, it's funny. I come from uh, uh, like early days, wild west performance marketing, that's uh, which was uh, affiliate marketing where literally we're taking, you know, we were working with affiliate networks where we'd get dating offers and or ringtone offers or these kind of like, so my mind, I have this very narrow perception of what affiliate means. Uh, and I'm curious in you, in the sense of your business, how does, how does, what does affiliate actually mean? Meg, go for it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's all of the, the partnerships that are, um, that, that we have that are driving, that are specifically tied to like to revenue. And that is, so if you look at the full funnel, the top of funnel is, um, our, our editorial partnerships. So the Buzzfeeds, the Meredith Corps, all of those, um, we give them a percentage of the revenue that they drive through their pieces. Um, and we use a platform called Share Sale. And um, over at State, we use Pepper Jam as the, the, the actual platform. And then we set a rate for the different types of partners. So top of top of funnel, we have, have top tier editorial, we have bloggers, we have influencers all our partners within the program. And those both tell our story and uh, the brand story and the, the product story. And then in the middle of funnel, you have um, like, you also have like, you also have bloggers, review sites, um, and, and those typically have, so the, the higher up in the funnel, the, the higher rate that we provide because they're just kind of like doing a heavier lift in terms of 
in, in terms of the storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, and then middle of funnel, we have um, kind of an in-between rate. And the lower funnel, those are kind of like your 2%, 3%. Um, and those are um, like when somebody is really far down in the conversion, um, they're, they're ready to buy, um, the, the, like getting them over the edge with you know, things like, um, like discounting or like or you know, gift gift of purchase, um, those sorts of things allow people like allow that decision to make be made um, a lot easier. So um, that's it's it's really any partnership that's like we're we're providing a percentage of the revenue. Um, uh, newsletters um, can also be part of that. That's the, you know typically um, like upper to mid funnel. Um, so it's 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 a very strong um, it's a very strong um channel for for both brands um we've, we have our um uh, lowest cpas and um you know it's it's almost like how i can't grow that i can't grow it fast enough like it's it's really um it's it's really performing um performing well for we had a, a real simple feature in in state bags that just knocked it out of the park with with just one article so it's like if you can kind of get that formula right and the right mix between top top middle and, and bottom and lower funnel um, affiliates, it, it could be a really um, I, I I recommend it for most brands even at the earlier earliest stages because it's really worth worth the investment having other people tell you know promote your brand for you. I love it, and that and that really expands my my you know my vision of what of what affiliate is at at a at a fast growing D two C business. So thank you for that. And even just one step further on affiliate, we got one more last question that we'd love to ask. But uh, this question, uh, I see, Jurian, you said uh, that uh, you know Stojo is Tupperware two point for millennial and Gen Z, which I really like because my mom uh, growing up was quite a uh, a Tupperware affiliate. And I was wondering, like, can we expect uh, like Stojo parties? I guess after the pandemic, will we have Stojo parties or what? You know, um, so what what's hilarious um, is that, so Megan and I are actually, you know, life partners together. And um, she came on board last summer after we we kind of went through a, a downsizing because of, of COVID and um, we really had to just focus on on cash conservation uh, through the pandemic, as you can imagine, as a travel and a commuter product primarily. Um, up until the launch of the bowl, now we're we're food storage as well, so we've we've got that home story. Um, we, um, um, gosh, I lost my train of thought. We were yes, you I were asking Tupperware. Tupperware. Tupperware, yeah. So Tupperware parties, we were, we're, we're always throwing ideas off each other and we attended um, a few, you know, events on Zoom with some friends and family and things like that. And, and then I don't know if you recall, but there was, there was a time during the summer when um, some, some really big names, artists and Michelle Obama were kind of doing things that were getting like, you know, tens of thousands of people online. And there's a there's a huge kind of throwback um, kind of movement nowadays, right? Everything back in the 80s and 90s is cool again, um, and it harkens a lot to kind of I think Gen Z and and millennials kind of like um, childhoods. And um, so we're like, man, wouldn't it be cool if we could create a modern version of a Tupperware party? where you as a brand could invest and instead of doing this huge expensive activation you just get some really relevant talent you really make an event around it and then you just in a really kind of like matter of fact low lift not over selly kind of way you know promote stojo and reusables and stuff like that um so we haven't we haven't necessarily done that yet um but those tupperware parties were incredible i actually um, as a six-year-old boy, I, I went to some Tupperware parties in, in my in my neighborhood, yep. and and my aunt bought stuff. Um, you know, money was made. And if you look at Tupperware today, I mean, I think they do two billion dollars in revenue a year globally, and most of that's from their direct sales channel. So there's there's certainly something uh, there. Uh, the the question is, um, you know, how do you do it thoughtfully? How do you do it in a really relevant way? Um, you know, how do you, how do you make it make sense to millennial and Gen Z consumers, um, and have it be authentic and, and, and kind of like different, right? Cause you don't want to just do exactly what somebody else has done. Um, but I love that you went there. Um, and, and it's definitely been, been on our, on our kind of ideation sessions. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. 
Awesome. Yeah, I mean, there's also like there's there's also the element uh, around Tupperware. It's it has such a strong brand. It's almost like the like the the, the Kleenex. But um, it, there's the the Tupperware parties. There's the the direct sales model. But there's also the um, just you know, the the go to food storage and you know drinkware brand for for the next generation that really stands for for uh, for sustainability, living more sustainably, um, not wasting things, not wasting food, not, not wasting, not wasting like the, the wastefulness of single use containers. So there, there is really a story there that, that, um, you know, that we bring to the table and the, the product roadmap that really kind of is about, about taking over your, um, your, your Tupperware drawer and, and making it organized, making it tidy, uh, that like Mary Kondo, beautifully stacked. You're not losing your lids. They they connect together, collapse down, and stack up. And we're really excited for the storytelling around that because people right now want their homes to be very organized. And um, and and that food storage cabinet drawer, et cetera, is a pain point for a lot of people. As yeah. you expand your product line too, right? So I think that that that's maybe you know as you have more and more of these types of solutions that not only like make people's lives better potentially, but also like look great in the cabinet, in the cupboard, look great. Like you can envision yourself like, oh, my life will be more organized once, once I have these. Yeah. It, it seems like, uh, it seems like you're set up for success. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's actually people. a big theme. Oh, sorry, Meg. But, oh, I was um, just saying people are buying two, three, four, five uh, bowls at a time and yeah. excited to use them in that way. Yeah. And, and what I was going to say, and, and you just hit on it, Eric, was that you know, not only does, we talked about having a, a reusable product like a coffee cup as kind of almost a, an eco status symbol, but um, if you can imagine if you're, you kind of care about your, your, you know, your, your image and you're walking into a place with a, with a, just like a gross looking kind of Tupperware and everything else about you is like fashionable and cool and, and all that. Um, you're checking that sustainability box and that that intentional living box, but it doesn't really look good. And I think that's where Stojo is going to come in and and just be like, wow, this is like, you know, we hope like a Tesla or an iPhone of our category. Um, yeah. and, that's but, where the and those existed in the 80s and 90s. We all had the same corning wares. We all had the same juice exactly. jugs. You know, it's so funny when you see those in movies that we all had. Yeah. Stojo could have the same form factor for the next generation. That's right. And that's really what we're going for. So. Cool opportunity. All right. What's our last question, KG? Awesome. Well, we have a we have a wrap up question that we like to ask, and that is, uh, let's say um, the government or a great friend just decided to give you fifty thousand dollars to grow your business, however the hell you want. Uh, how would you spend that fifty thousand dollars today? Fifty k today. Um, I would dump it into a new product that my team's telling me I have to hold off until 2022 to develop um, because I, I have about, you know, I don't know, 50 design ideas in my head that are all related. And I have to unfortunately wait uh, methodically until my team signs off on them. So um, I would go ahead and, and, and get one product to market faster in a new category for us. Very cool. What about you, Megan? Yeah. I, I don't want to create any dissension among the ranks. Oh, it's, it's all good. But, we love <laughs> what, what, what would you do with 50K? Same thing? You're muted, by the way. Um, that and uh, I, I, I agree with that. Like our product development, we're an innovation company. Yeah. So product development is, um, is, is incredibly important for us. And as we see, when we bring out new products, people are stoked. Um, and and we, we've seen that over the last several months. And um, so that, that is very, very important. And then, you know, as we, um, like, I, it's hard to dump, dump it into one place, but I, I'm, I'm really interested in, in partnering with, um, with a, a company that um, has come recommended by a, a bunch of my peers called Centis. And um, this is kind of like a, you know, I guess like a plug for them for a bit, like unintentionally, but I've been really interested in partnering with them. And I would, I would, um, like if, if I had like 50K coming out of the blue, I'd do a touch, uh, a test budget with them. And they, it's, a, it's an agency that curates, um, that curates performance driven influencers to, um, to do, uh, cr create video content. It's mostly YouTube based. And, 
um, to create YouTube content that drives um, that drives revenue for the business. And you can expect anywhere, you know, it's not like a, you know, a 510X ROAS, but to have something like that, that does, it is profitable spend that also does the brand storytelling, drives traffic to our site. Um, I think that would be a really interesting area. And then, and then be able to utilize the content for, um, you know, potentially TikTok, potentially, um, you know, blog, like our blog content. So I think that that would be a really valuable experiment. Very cool. We're going to check them out for sure. We're actually, our next uh, uh, course that we're putting on uh, with D2C Plus, our membership community, is a YouTube challenge where we're bringing in another sustainable icon, Ryan McKenzie from True Earth with his, with his laundry, yeah. oh, laundry pods. And he's we doing a whole thing on, on the anchor, on the video anchor creatives he's making and, and some of the other UGC stuff he's doing on YouTube. So really excited about that. That's exciting. Yeah. We um, just, uh, we, I just bought and ordered for the house, what, two weeks ago, Megan? Like 380 something True Earth uh, laundry detergent uh, sheets because how could I not? It comes in this little brick of a box and it's literally, I don't, maybe two or three years worth of laundry loads. I haven't even done the math, but I won't you be. know how much we do laundry? I, yeah. Okay. <laughs> maybe it's like, it's one year's worth of laundry. Yeah. But uh, we have like a, washing we have, diapers. That's, uh, yeah, that's we, yeah. Well, we have a four and a seven year old and, and they're, yeah. they, they get after it. Yeah. Um, so, but anyway, that's, that's such a great innovative way to, you know, lower carbon footprint and, and yeah. just really optimize uh, a category and just take it over. I love that. So say hi for me. Uh, well, we'll have to get you both on a podcast coming up here, a sustainable off or something. Oh, that'd be so love cool. That. That'd be love love Thank you guys so much for coming on today. I think there was so much information there. I, I think if people want to check out Sojo, they got to go to stojo.co right now and grab, like, what are you drinking? Out? I'm drinking out of a Bailey's mug that came with my Bailey's this Christmas. Like I need a Stojo. So and, and now that there's maybe in the opportunity, I could get a D2C logo put on my Stojo. I'm, I'm going to be there. Oh, so, absolutely. Um, Definitely, quick, yeah. quick plug, um, Eric and Kyle. So I just got the code over Slack. So Stojo Jurian, I, I have a real comedian there in the, in the back office, uh, but gets you 15% off. And um, I don't know how to, Jurian is J-U-R-R-I-E-N, like yep. Nancy. Um, I think that's going to be good for a couple weeks, and uh, my head at my head at ecom said it'll be good branding for me. So thank you very much, Irene. Appreciate it. Get the founder uh, story out there. Yeah. Uh, Stojo Jurian. If you want a discount, Stojo Jurian. Stojo Jurian. We'll make sure that's in the in the show notes. And yeah, thank you both so much for coming on today. And let's stay in touch. I, I'm I'm really excited to follow your journey. And, uh, and to have you guys join our D2C Plus community, which all podcast guests get to do. Uh, and always, we always ask as well, if there's ever anything you're thinking about, you know, you have on your mind, you, you want to write a blog post, we'd love to give you that outlet uh, to kind of reach, reach our audience and, and engage our community because we think there's a, a great fit here. Oh, that's, that's excellent. Thank you so much. And looking forward to definitely staying in touch and, and getting more involved with the community. So thank you. Cool. All right. Awesome. Peace. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank Later. Bye.